Hello and welcome to the program Hein Reykjavik or the other Reykjavik where we talk to real people about real issues. My name is Löve and today's program will be in English due to continue with our discussion from last Tuesday uh, which was about the Black Lives Matter movement and the uh, recent demonstration in Reykjavik which was last Wednesday. Um, now, on Tuesday, we spoke to uh, four black Americans living in Iceland about their experiences, uh, both from back home and here in Iceland. Um, and uh, three of our guests on Tuesday were also organizing the event uh, last Wednesday. And um, today we have with us two Americans living here. Uh, Lydia Holt, writer and artist from New York, and Seth Sharp, an entertainer from Connecticut. And also we have Sanna Madalena Mertedottir, who is a city councillor for the Socialist Party. Uh, now, like I said, we're going to carry on the discussion from Tuesday and kind of get feedback um, from the protest uh, that was, or the demonstration which was held in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, uh, addressing the latest um, events in America, the killing of, um, of uh, George Floyd and uh, what's happened after that, that it sparked uh, like demonstrations all across Europe and the United States. So um, we're going to start with uh, Sanna. You were one of the speakers uh, last Wednesday. Um, how was the the, the 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 protest and like what happened basically yes uh, even yeah uh, even though we were gathered there um due to horrific events it was good to see that a lot of people showed up uh, i've heard we were just under 4000 people i've been hearing the number like maybe 3500 or around 4000 so that is like around 1% of the Icelandic population. So that is a good turnout. And this is also the first event that has been held after like this uh, COVID kind of ban on gatherings. So that has been like um, changing throughout the days. And we've been having like the social distancing and restrictions, but um, this gathering was held in an open space and it was good to see people coming together for this cause and solidarity. Um, I must admit it was, um, it was difficult, but at the same time, it was good to be in a crowd with people that are there to say enough is enough. Um, and I feel like they're, are a lot of people in Iceland um, that truly want to see change and they want to use uh, their white privilege to good. Um, but there's also a lot in Iceland that uh, we need to change when we're like talking about racism. So that is maybe another topic, but it is closely related to this topic of racism in a whole, so maybe we'll come to that later, but yeah, it was good to stand together in solidarity. Yeah, yeah, it was actually, there was, yeah, I think there was uh, like three, they said 3,500 up to 4,000 people there, so um, it was a very good turnout and just really touching to see so many people. Uh, now, <laughs> also joining us here is uh, Eric Barbour from, from America also, thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, sorry, I, I did not introduce you initially because we didn't know if you were going to be here. But welcome. That's okay. Also. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, now, all of you, Seth, Lydia and Eric, us, you were all at the protest on Wednesday. Yes. And, uh, yes. Um, let me start with, the, who wants to start? How was it for you as an American? Um, I can start. Um, yeah. yeah, I was there. The whole day I had been debating whether or not I was going to go because I was feeling at moments super hopeless 
I'm just like, what's the point of all of this? And I'm like, no, I think I would feel better if I go and I see other people gather, um, see people willing to make changes in the world, other people who are, who are feeling the same pain and people who empathize with that pain and want to do something about it. Um, so in the end, I'm really glad that I went. Um, and I saw a lot of people that I didn't even know lived in Iceland. It's like, I didn't realize all of these black people lived in Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. And also I was, you know, of course, able to see um, a lot of my friends and just feel supported and like, it's, we're not alone in this. Yeah. So that was great. Yeah. Um, Eric? Yeah, to... actually, for me, it was, it was, it was really, uh, comforting to know that that many people sh would show up um, and support. I think the message was pretty loud and clear. I hope that everyone there, you know, fully embraced what he was saying, because it was pretty far powerful. And he, he showed, he put a lot of emotion into it, which to me made it even that much more uh, powerful. Um, I I also didn't know that there were that many uh, brown people in Iceland. That I was pretty surprised, but it was it was good. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I just didn't know if. Also, I didn't know if that many people were going to show up. Show up, but I was surprised and pleasantly surprised. And it it it, it shines a light on the awareness here that people can actually you know come together and, and listen to that and and hopefully they can contribute something to it in the future yeah uh seth um I'll come to you next you have been living in iceland for a while so uh, yeah. how, how was this for you last wednesday i thought that it was beautiful the the turnout i wasn't sure what to expect in terms of how many people would be there. Um, I also thought that I was expecting maybe a hundred people because sometimes, uh, because I've had very negative and very positive experiences in Iceland regarding race. So I really wasn't sure uh, if there were gonna be counter protesters, if people would show up, if people cared, if uh, trolls were going to show up and when I saw this diverse group of people, uh, especially young people, and the young people were very attentive, and the young people knew what was going on, and that made me so emotional, uh, just because young people are very connected. You know, they, they have the internet with them always, and so they know what's going on, and so they were familiar with the terms that the speakers were using, and they were familiar with uh, the situations that uh, were going on. And to see such um, an educated populace that was not only educated, but in support of this movement was very touching. Yeah. I, uh, the whole time, normally when, when, there's a, when there's a protest, I'll go downtown and I will uh, put it on Facebook Live because um, the people back home, they wanna see what's going on in Iceland because oftentimes if there is a, a news story, um, it can be difficult because things are sensationalized. Uh, you know, so a volcano erupts and then you know, you'll get 100 messages from people asking if you're dead, you know, because yeah. <laughs> there's ash everywhere. So, <laughs> so <clears throat> it's kind of helpful when you see <clears throat> a Facebook Live video and you can actually see what is going on. And the people that were watching it from overseas were overwhelmed. They, they could not believe that so many people of all colors were there showing support. Yeah. And, you know, they shared it and people were crying and people were just, um, they were in shock. Yeah. And I was in shock. So I, I thought that for the most part, this was an incredibly beautiful moment in Icelandic history. And... In the years I've lived here, I've never experienced anything like that. Yeah. No. Th th there was no interpreter for the other culture. Because I, oftentimes when I have seen um, a cultural event, you know, 
uh, an Icelander, a white Icelander has to, you know, sort of get up and, you know, and say, we will now present you with these people who will do their thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think this, this was actually like quite, quite uh, unique regarding that experience that, that it was black people organizing it, you know, yeah. and speaking, you know, yeah. just white people talking about black people's issues, <laughs> or black people, you know, if, yeah. To put it quite bluntly, it's it's kind of the race discussion here is is very um, yeah white centered and uh, and uh, I mean it's just the, the discussions. I know that a lot of you that don't speak Icelandic have been excluded from the a lot of the discussion that has been going on since the event or around the event. But there is a lot of uh, white fragility going on <laughs> <laughs> because. Uh, white Icelanders don't really feel comfortable discussing race because they yeah. very often see their, themselves as very liberal and they don't want to kind of confess <laughs> their own racism. Yeah. But this is something that we have to take on as white people. We have to recognize that some things we say are racist. It doesn't mean we're bad people, but you know, we just have to kind of change our speech, change our language, everything. Uh, and yeah. I, so I just want to come to that as um, because I, I, I mean I have no clue like what the ideas you had about Iceland before coming here but what have your experiences been like compared to what you thought it was going to be like before um, hmm. um, Lady, or who of you wants to start <laughs> yeah I'll start I'll start uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Because, um, um, it's been it's been pretty good I mean because you're, you're a new yeah? yeah, 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 <laughs> really new. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm fresh off the boat, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's um, It's been a different experience, you know. I think the culture here is kind of more or less everyone kind of keeps to themselves mm -hmm. and speak, they speak, but it's nothing like, you know, in the States, you know, somebody's like, oh, how you doing? And here they pretty much don't do that, but the guys I work with, some of the guys I work with, the young guys, even one of them, one of them even asked me before how I feel about him saying the word uh, nigger. And, but it was a conversation and you can't get anywhere unless you start a conversation about something. And he, you know, he just, hey, ask, how do you feel about it? How do you feel about me using the word? And that right there was surprising to me because I don't think anybody in my lifetime in the states, as any 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 uh, non-black person has ever asked me, how do I feel about them using the word? It's usually you know something that a video of you seen you've seen or or something on TV. But personally, one on one, never. But here, I he actually came to me and said that, and I was less like, whoa, what do you mean? How do I feel about it? And it was just like he's like, I want to know how you feel about it because it's it's in music, it's in, in videos. I was like, and I told him, I gave him, you know my 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 view on it and it was just surprising because in the states never happened but here less than two years a young dude in his early 20s is asking me that we i commend him on that for even starting the conversation yeah. but it shows kind of that we need the discussion yeah 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 and he was but he wasn't like like you said he wasn't afraid to have it it was just he was walking Purely by me at work curiosity yeah, yeah, and so I kind of just broke it down for him, and he was like, oh, okay, all right, conversation, no big deal. Nobody got their feelings hurt, nobody felt inferior, or anything like that. It was just a conversation, a quick conversation we had, and uh, that was that. Yeah. No big deal. Nobody, nobody had any issues with the conversation. Yeah. Lydia, do you want to? Yeah, um, before we moved here, um, I had been here quite a bit because I met my husband in 2002. Um, and before I came here the very first time, he was just like, I want to prepare you. <laughs> there are very, very few black people in Iceland. It's just, it's going to be a little different. And, you know, it is. It's 
especially since I was living in New York City, it's completely different. Um, but everyone was like, I never had any serious issues around my race. There were, there have been comments like, oh, are you from Ethiopia? Or so, like just something very, it just seems strange for a black American. It's just like, no, I'm not Ethiopian. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just an American. And they're like, but where are you from? I'm like, well, if you want to get to the nitty gritty, <laughs> my ancestors are probably from West Africa. And they're like, oh, okay. And that was, that was the extent of it. Um, but yeah, in the past three years that I've been living here, like not, not just visiting, um, it's been pretty, um, I don't want to say racism free, but it's not really talked about, which is what you were saying before. Like race isn't really talked about in Iceland. Yeah. And I think maybe for fear of getting into a conversation about race and racism. Yeah. When Icelanders wanting to believe that, they're, oh, that doesn't exist here. So we yeah. don't even need to talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Seth? But yeah, yeah, you've been here the longest. So I'm sure you have a more <laughs> nuanced experience. You've had more in-depth experiences, I'm sure. I was incredibly excited to move to Iceland. Uh, I was living in New York City. And in a two-year period, I had been stopped by the police 26 times, uh, you know, with their guns out, <clears throat> calling for backup, all called, you know. And I was never involved in any type of criminal activity whatsoever, which made things worse. And so when I came to Iceland to visit and I saw this lack of that type of a police presence, um, Iceland was just going to be a respite from that. And so initially when I came, that's what stood out to me the most was that um, I could go, I could get on a bike at three o'clock in the morning in the summertime and just ride it anywhere in any neighborhood. And I didn't have to worry about getting, uh, you know, having police take their guns out. Um, <clears throat> over the years, things changed in the sense of, and, and this is kind of hard to explain, but in, in Iceland, I feel like you start to experience institutionalized racism as you, as you move through society, as you move up into society. And that's where if you, for example, have a blue collar job, um, you are not necessarily going to run into people trying to hold you down, you know, uh, because people are happy that a foreigner is, is doing this job. But uh, as you move up through society, that's when the ugliness really starts to, <laughs> to show. And I remember, um, because I lived in an absolute fantasy world about how um, unracist um, Iceland was. And I remember um, when a bunch of composers asked me to do some of their songs uh, to, to possibly represent Iceland in Eurovision. Mm. And the first night um, of the competition, uh, the, the first song that I sang ended up getting into the finals or the semifinals or something like that. Mm. And I was walking down the street after the TV program with my friends because we were going to celebrate. And, you know, we always walk down the way bigger because I live downtown. And a car full of young Icelandic people just pulls up beside me, rolls down the window, nigger, go back to Africa. And that, that, that had never happened before. And I remember that walk from the middle of Leovager to the bottom of Leovager. And uh, I had quite a few obscene things yelled at me. You know, Iceland for Iceland, uh, Iceland for Icelanders, you know, Fara du Heim, Fara to Africa. And, you know, go back to Africa. And it was crazy that this just happened just like that. Um, that there were some people who were that threatened by the idea 
that an African-American person could be representing Iceland in Eurovision, mm -hmm. that they were going to put a stop to that. And that for me was a turning point in seeing that it wasn't exactly the utopia that I had yeah. thought that it was and that there was a lot of work yeah. that needed to be done. So, but that's definitely not, you know, and, and I definitely don't want to paint like an absolutely negative picture because I think Iceland has a lot of very informed and wonderful people. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't have continued to live here. And I still feel safe. I still, you know, I still go jogging at different hours of the night. And, and I definitely feel like I'm privileged in being able to do that. Um, but yeah. Those experiences and then having negative experiences with the police here, again, being not involved in any type of criminal activity whatsoever and, and being profiled and being stopped by the police and having the police behave aggressively, you know, those things are pretty terrible and those things are, are pretty shocking when you compare them to your other daily experiences in Iceland being around for the most part especially if you live in one-on-one, you know, mm -hmm. informed, enlightened people who, um, who tend to know what's going on in the world. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're driving a friend home and then, you know, the police are very aggressively, you know, yelling at you, you know, for no reason. And you're saying, oh, why are you stopping me? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. do you have drugs? Have you been partying? You know, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. You know, and, and as a person, you know, who is completely sober, does no drugs, uh, that is shocking yeah. to be in that position, especially when you, when you compare it, when you ask Icelandic people, when you ask your Icelandic friends, yeah. have you ever been stopped by the police? And the majority of them say no. Yeah. They say, have you been stopped by the police? And the police say, do you have drugs in you? Have you, you know, are, are they aggressive with you instantly? And, and I don't have a single Icelandic friend who has been in that, who has told me that they have been in that situation. So <clears throat> that's where I think that sometimes being in Iceland can be both paradise and hell um, from a racial standpoint, because you can experience wonderful tolerance and acceptance, but then you can also experience ugliness that you're not really prepared for when you compare it to the wonderful tolerance. Yeah. Lydia, you wanted to say something? No, I was just agreeing with what he was saying, yeah. that Iceland has, has both sides to it. And I feel like a lot of people who don't live in Iceland have this idea that Iceland is some sort of utopia. Yeah. That, you know, like, oh, when the, when the bankers are going crazy, Icelanders immediately protested to handle that situation. When that happened, you know, Icelanders, you know, just make everything happen. And it's true. I feel like Icelanders do try to take action immediately when they know something is wrong but Icelanders are also human yeah. and humans have isms of yeah. all sorts <laughs> and, and it doesn't make them bad people. It makes them people. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like when we talk about racism and racist actions and racist things that people say, mm -hmm. um, we have to think of it. We have to reframe the way we think of it. Um, I once heard someone say that we should think of racism or saying racist things is like you having something stuck in your teeth. Like you're walking around with a big piece of spinach in your teeth and nobody is saying anything mm -hmm. until somebody says, hey, you know, you got something in your teeth. Mm. And the person might be embarrassed and then like take it out, but they, they don't think, oh my God, I'm a horrible person because I had spinach in my teeth. <laughs> and so like, if you do something racist, if you say something racist, if some racist uh, legislation is put in place, we should be able to say, hey, you're not a bad person, but you got some big racist spinach in your teeth and yeah. you need to handle it. How can we fix it? Yeah. And I don't think anybody would argue that they actually want to have spinach in their teeth. Exactly. <laughs> nobody <laughs> nobody spinach, wants to walk around like racism. that. <laughs> yeah. I actually so, want that spinach in my teeth. I want it there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's a good analogy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's because um, it's uh, it's it's also like like I said, Icelanders are very reluctant to kind of include race, and I think it's because you know obviously the, we have a 
big white minority, ma majority, sorry. Yeah. And uh, and this is actually a talked about thing, you know, in other countries, that if you're white, you don't really, uh, like the, just the word race suggests brown people, you know. Yeah. So, because uh, we as white people, we can go through our lives without ever thinking about race mm -hmm. until we encounter people of other races. Right. So it's kind of, the, it's very uh, white centered. And I think this is the problem for most white Icelanders. But uh, like, maybe I'll, I'll come to you, Sanna, because you are a brown Icelander. And uh, this is, uh, yeah, this kind of exclusion of the, um, of the black and brown experience in Iceland is very kind of, um, yeah, it's, it's a big taboo. Like, uh, I, 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 and I actually, I think I'll come next to the, um, there was a big conference, uh, I think it took place over three days, that was uh, about the Me Too movement. It was called Me Too Moving Forward. And uh, the keynote speaker was Angela Davis, which is a legend, you know, yeah, I met her and I talked to her. And yeah, it was amazing. And I got a picture of me yeah. with her, and I was just like so starstruck. And yeah, we were talking like about feminism, and and um, in the past I have been talking about how I see um, feminism here in Iceland and how I have experienced it as being um, centered around the needs of. Yeah, I've basically labeled it white middle, middle class feminism as many other people um, in other European countries as well has been have been discussing feminism. Yeah. And the mainstream voices as it doesn't really um, discuss the needs of poor women and, and women of color. So this is something growing up, I feel like the voices of many have been excluded. And just basically, if you're not like um, a white woman and um, don't have any disabilities and you know, yeah, yeah, it's just basically a really neat box and woman, yeah, so basically white, Middle class feminism, and um, uh, this is something that I've been talking about for a really long time. Because growing up, I've received a lot of questions about, like, you know, where are you from? And I say, like, oh yeah, I'm from, I'm from here. But no, where are you, you know, really from? I'm like, oh, I'm from Breitholt. You know, like, where are you really, really from? I'm like, oh yeah, my granddad, you know, my family, they're from Isafjörður. They're like, no, stop being silly with me. Stop playing. I mean, where are you from? I'm like, I'm from the womb of my mother. They're like, no. I mean, why are you so dark skinned? I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm always tanning, you know. I really like to go tanning. <laughs> and people are just like basically asking, why is a brown person claiming to be Icelandic? That just doesn't add up in my worldview that just doesn't make sense can you please explain it to me why you are claiming to be Icelandic because that just doesn't make sense and because uh, Seth was like talking about representation earlier and in the minds of so many people it just doesn't seem to make sense that Icelandic people could be black that Icelandic people could be brown and this is also something that we see in the fact that um when i when people in iceland icelandic people start to address you in english like hello can i help you with something i'm like nei takk ég bara skoða yeah yeah okay láttu mig bara vita við get aðstaða við and they're like okay yeah just let me know if i can help you with anything i'm like takk fyrir <laughs> so it's like yeah they're like um just based on the way you look they're like um letting you know with all of these comments um that you don't look like an Icelander and I'm gonna treat you this way. And um I've also heard people saying like, oh you know, you can't 
react this way. We have a lot of tourists living in Iceland, and that's the only reason um, you have received this treatment in the past. People, you know, speaking Icelandic to you. But I mean, I've been in shops where um, white people have been talked to customers in Icelandic, and I've been talked to in English, and it turned out that the customers that um, were asked questions in Icelandic were actually tourists, mm -hmm. and I was the one speaking Icelandic. So yeah, I actually wrote a master's thesis about it, a long master's thesis where I interviewed um, 15 individuals living here, a uh, mixed race, a brown Icelanders, dark-skinned Icelanders, and it's called but where are you really from? So that was my master's thesis in anthropology. So I was also like kind of shocked seeing a lot of dark skinned people living in Iceland turning out for the demonstration, like all of these black people and brown people. I'm like, wow, okay, wow, you you live here. We need to meet up. This is amazing. <laughs> so, so many of us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's yeah. not a club. Yeah. But so what, this, oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, because uh, just quickly, uh, I, why I wanted to bring up the Me Too Moving Forward uh, conference. I met you there, Lydia, also, mm -hmm. and you were there. Uh, there was a lot of panel discussions. Like I said, it was a three-day event. We had Angela Davis as keynote speaker, who is a legend, uh, and was talking about intersectionality. We need to address race. Uh, if we're not addressing race, we are not addressing the problem. There, there was a full conference hall full of people, full of white feminists and feminists, feminists of, of all colors, mainly white feminists though, who were, you know, applauding Angela Davis' speech. Yet, uh, there was not one panel on the, on the black and brown Icelandic experience. Mm -hmm. It's always kind of uh, treated as a, uh, a foreign issue. Racism mm -hmm. is, is a foreign issue. It's not the issue of Icelanders. And uh, Sanna was not invited to speak, <laughs> for example. She is the first person of color voted into office um, in Iceland, uh, or the first elected official of, of color. And uh, she was not invited to speak there. And she has done a master thesis on the, <laughs> on the subject. Right. So, um, and all the panel discussions on racism were kind of with foreign women. Mm -hmm. But still, we have a lot of Icelandic people of color who are either mixed race, uh, were adopted, or are children of immigrants, mm -hmm. like second yeah. generation. So we have a lot of Icelandic people of color, but it's not a discussion that is considered an Icelandic problem. So Lydia, I hand, hand it over to you. You were at the conference. Yeah, I was. And you live in Iceland. So. And I live in Iceland. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, What's your take on it? No, yeah, I actually didn't really think about it until the other speakers, like the non-Icelandic speakers at the conference brought it up. Like, oh, you know, if you're not, as you said, if you're not talking about race, if you're not also talking about poverty, if you're not talking about uh, ableism, you're not talking about women's issues. Like you have to include everyone in these discussions and to have solutions for everyone. Um, and just hearing Sana say that, you did your thesis on this with 15 people who have clearly lived their entire lives in Iceland and have lifetimes of experience <laughs> with race and have experienced racism here. Um, it's clearly not a new issue for Iceland. No. Um, but for whatever reason, people don't want to talk about it. Well, oh, I think we know the reason. People don't want to feel bad. But um, yeah, I think if anything comes out of having the Black Lives Matter movement gain more international momentum is to have more of a worldwide discussion about race um, because people are moving all over the world. Like the African diaspora is everywhere. We'll find black people living everywhere in the world. And um, Iceland being number one, very small, but number two, also relatively very open to new ideas. Um, I think makes it a perfect place to um, to make these kinds of changes. 
regarding race, gender, class, all of it. Um, yeah. Oh, I wanted to um, add on uh, the point that you were making earlier about um, people assuming that you don't speak Icelandic um, because I've experienced that. Because I remember when I, when I moved here, a lot of people convinced me that, um, you know, life would be just golden for me if I learned to speak Icelandic. So I went through the trouble and I went to the university uh, to take the Icelandic program to learn how to speak it. And um, of course, you know, life didn't become golden because I, <laughs> because I spoke <laughs> Icelandic. <laughs> it became more frustrating in the sense that people would refuse to speak Icelandic to me. And I remember one time I was, um, I had just done a show or something like that. And um, I was in the paper and I, and I was flying I can't remember if I was flying back to Iceland or flying, you know, from New York or vice versa. And <clears throat> I'm sitting on the plane and the, the, the flight attendant on Iceland Air, this is when they used to come by with Morgan Blade and Fretta Blade, you know, the newspapers, and they would say, Morgan Blade, Fretta Blade, you know. And then I raised my hand. The flight attendant looks at me and she said, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, these newspapers are only for Icelandic people. And I looked at her and I said, I'm in that paper. I want to read the article that's about me. And she bristled a little bit. <laughs> you know, she was definitely very salty. And then she finally gives it to me. And I thumbed through it and I opened the page and there I was. And you know how when somebody doesn't want to admit they're wrong, uh, you know, it was that kind of a thing. And I wrote Iceland Air and they were very gracious about it. And they said that they would train their employees to not make assumptions about who spoke Icelandic and, and who didn't. Um, but that's one of the, you know, sometimes it's funny, but sometimes it's very frustrating because a lot of times I, I will have friends, um, you know, who are white, who are immigrants as well. And we will go into a store, we'll go into some situation, whether they are blonde, whether they are dark haired, uh, doesn't matter. They will be spoken to in Icelandic. I will have to translate for them even in the midst of me translating, the Icelandic person will then speak to me in English. I will speak back to them in English. I mean, in Icelandic, they will speak back to me in English. And sometimes, you know, people will just not admit, they will just not accept the fact that, <laughs> that they profiled you and that they were wrong, that they assumed that your white friend <laughs> spoke Icelandic and that, and, and that you didn't. Yeah. And uh, so that's frustrating. And, and an, another story, um, I was at uh, a ball um, for the prime minister, one of the prime ministers a while back when I, when I first moved here. And you know, you're there with all these fancy people and, and dignitaries, diplomats and stuff. And, and one of the, the, the people there cornered me. Where are you from? From the United States. But where are you really, really from? And, and these are the kind of things that you don't get used to you, you don't expect them or accept, accept them in certain environments, you know, in, in an environment like that where you expect everyone, you know, you're around diplomats, you're around people who, who know how to be diplomatic, who know how to not say stupid uh, things, you know, how, how to not be racist. But um, sometimes, and I've experienced that in this country, people feel that uh, the rules are different because there are so few of you so we can get away with this yeah. and this woman hounded me she she literally she followed me around um because she was trying she was going to get me to admit you know what tribe in africa i was from and <laughs> and she says to the person that i was with who invited me to this prime minister's ball uh your friend is being rude <laughs> she you, says it in Icelandic. you were being rude I was being rude, she says it in Icelandic which I understood and I just uh, so yeah, this is w when somebody wants me to sort of give a synopsis of racism in Iceland the way that it works this is kind of how it does, this is kind of how it works you know, it's, it's this very sort of weird subtle, you know, we can get away with it because, you know it's, it's a very mixed bag that I have not 
experience in other countries. Yeah. yeah. I have to say, I also find it more difficult to, to figure out if a person is being genuinely curious, mm-hmm. like they honestly just don't know and they just want to know, or if they're doing what this woman was doing. Mm-hmm. Like trying to make you admit your otherness to her and explain it to her. And it's like, I need you to tell me in, you know, minute detail how other you are from me. And mm-hmm. I demand you tell me now. <laughs> it's like, I owe you nothing. I'm at a party. <laughs> I'm not asking where in Norway your ancestors came from, am I? Oh. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's bizarre. It's yeah. a bizarre experience sometimes. Yeah. yeah. I can imagine. And yes, uh, Eric, because you are a newcomer, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you, yes, I am. Icelandic yet? No. Uh, <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> my vocabulary um, is is very limited right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes time. We, we know that it's not the easiest language on the planet. <laughs> but how how do you feel like with with the language situation? Is it very? But do you feel very excluded <laughs> from society uh, or is it easy to get by just on English or? Um, sometimes, it, it, it depends. Um, uh, at work, it's, it's really not an issue. Uh, a lot of the young, young guys I work with or most people that I work with, they speak English, you know, fairly well and they know that I don't speak it fluently, so they're they're okay with it. And but um, outside of there, like in a business environment, retail stores or whatever, uh, you know, I, I kind of limit my conversation um, because I don't speak it. So, and I feel like I'm here. Yeah. I should learn how to speak it, and the experiences that they've had that they're talking about here it, it's it's eye opening it is so it's it's i still i'm like i said i'm still new here so i haven't had those experiences yet but now i look forward to having them <laughs> really <laughs> so it's 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 eye opening it definitely is it definitely you know gives it a different perspective for me yeah but some of those issues, some of those issues that have been discussed here about, you know, people speaking to them in English when they clearly can speak Icelandic. I've had some of those same issues in the States. I've had uh, questions like, I mean, from, from black people ask me, do you speak English? And I've had like in Jersey, Ethiopians ask me, oh, you look like you're from, you're from where I'm from, which is, I'm cool with that. But the experiences that they've had here are some of the same experiences I've had in the States. So it's, for me, it's, it's kind of like, I just shake that off and, and just keep it moving. But still, nonetheless, it's still an issue. It is still an issue. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I want to um, come back to the uh, demonstration um, last, Wednesday, which was like uh, like we said before, it was a very good turnout. It was a beautiful moment. Uh, I, I kind of want to discuss with you like where we can go from here, like where can we take this, and where, how can we bring it into the Icelandic discussion for all the people of color who are living here. Is there that's, any? That's a good question. It's a big question. And I have no idea. (laughs) I feel like it's a great learning opportunity for Iceland, like what's happening in the United States. Of course, the United States has a long history of racism and oppression, like from the very beginning. So it's very deeply entrenched. Um, But I feel like Iceland can avoid that same fate. As more and more people, non-Icelanders moving here, more and more Icelanders of color are the, our numbers are growing. It's important to know how not to work as a multicultural society. It's like to know what doesn't work. Yeah. The United States is a prime example of what does not work. Yeah. And, so, and so if we can here in Iceland, from the beginning, listen to the voices 
of the of minority groups of people who are not being listened to right now the people who are being shushed when you say oh this happened to me i had this experience um going to the hospital or going working in any sort of government institution being told five different things either because you don't speak icelandic or you don't have someone in your family if you don't have someone in your family that speaks icelandic that is an icelander sometimes it can be very difficult to maneuver through all kinds of government institutions in Iceland because you're just kind of ignored. And you have to have like, oh, you have your husband, you have your wife, have your in-laws call on your behalf to get the information that you need to figure out how you do, you know, how do you get a mortgage? How do I go to a doctor? How do I do anything? Yeah. Um, so I think if, if Icelanders are just willing to listen to the experiences of, that people are having and fix the simple problems that people bring up, like not assuming that just because a person is brown that they aren't Icelandic. I think we just start addressing those small problems while they're small, while they are small and haven't turned into massive issues. I think it would be great for Iceland. How you do that, I'm not totally sure. <laughs> The, yeah, the leaders of the civil rights movement uh, were pretty excellent in sort of laying a framework for change. And one of the biggest focuses was on both changing laws and uh, ensuring that those laws are enforced. And um, one, one of my favorite quotes from Martin Luther King says, it may be true that the law cannot make a man love me, but it can keep him from lynching me. And I think that's pretty important. And in Iceland, we do have these laws that are there to support, that are, they are supposed to protect uh, people from racial attacks. Um, they are supposed to protect people from, you know, attacks or discrimination on gender, uh, sexual orientation, et cetera. The problem is enforcement. And I've had personal experience with this, uh, you know, from, from being attacked and threatened, um, where racial epithets were used and going to the police and the police have said to me um, explicitly, we don't actually prosecute for this. <laughs> and, and I actually, I had printed out, you know, the, the particular law about, um, about uh, you know, hate crimes and I brought it to the police station. And he said, we do not actually prosecute this. We are not interested in prosecuting this. And I kept pushing it further. And the police officer said uh, that he would contact the, the, the department attorney. <clears throat> and that attorney got back to him and said, we do not actually prosecute this. We are not interested in prosecuting this. So the thing is that <clears throat> Iceland has a, it has experience with um, prosecuting social laws, for example, uh, laws that protect people's uh, identity. Um, it can be very easy to sue a person for slander or for libel. And um, you will see newspapers, for example, go to great lengths to not put the names of a, of a suspected criminal or, you know, people will do very much to protect a person's identity until it becomes public record. So we see that if there are actually consequences within the law to enforce the law, that um, these things become sort of very helpful and end up um, becoming a part of the culture. So it seems that in Iceland, if it's going to be a more fair and equal society for the people of color that live here, perhaps we need to focus on there being consequences for enforcement or for non-enforcement of the law, whether those are financial consequences, you know, to the police or to, to people, to individuals, um, you know, for, for non-enforcement. <laughs> However it goes down that, um, that enforcement uh, needs to be enforced. I think that that has to be a huge priority because as Martin Luther King says, Trying to convince people to love you or to see your perspective is a lot more difficult than getting people to obey the law when there are consequences. 
and eventually having to obey the law just becomes a cultural norm. You see what I'm saying? When you realize that you are not able to do something, it just becomes a part of the culture that, that you don't do it. After that, people then start to justify why they don't do it. And oftentimes that can be a positive justification. And so that, that's how I would like to see the movement um, go forward is, you know, working with um, government officials, uh, you know, such as yourself, Sana, and, um, you know, to actually looking at the laws that are actually in place and seeing what is the rate of enforcement and what can we do to actually get them to be enforced. Because the laws are there and because Iceland definitely, um, you know, brags about its progressiveness. Yeah. But we can't brag about our progressiveness if we are not actually enforcing that progressiveness. It becomes just as hollow as America bragging about its freedom if it's not actually enforcing that yeah. freedom for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And um, do you, Sanna or Eric, want to add to this? I think Iceland needs to take a good deep look inwards because we really showed up on Wednesday but are we willing to show up for other instances of racism here in Iceland? I mean, because it is happening in Iceland, it has been happening, and um, it may not be of the same scale, but it is racism. So that is something we need to address at the same time as we are, you know, screaming Black Lives Matter, we need to be addressing racism here as well, well and be vocally against that here. So I think that is something that we are finally willing to do now. And just earlier on the news, I heard like on the radio, the Icelandic news, that was um, 12 o'clock, two different news um, where they were talking to to women of color that um, yeah had lived here and were talking about their experiences. So I was like, wow, two uh, news, two different topics here in Iceland. So this is something like you don't hear about a lot in Iceland. So I was like, okay, is this happening? Are we gonna have this discussion? Is this gonna last longer than a couple of days? So maybe it's finally happening that we are willing to open up and have this talk because it's long overdue Definitely. that we finally get into it. Definitely. But I don't know how it is for people that haven't maybe been here for long. Eric. Yeah, yeah but I think, I think Seth, he put, put it into a uh, great perspective. If when the laws tend to, to, to fail you, when you're like his example of going to the, police station and telling them, having to explain to them, these are the laws. I think he put it best, you know, when that doesn't work, there has to be some type of financial consequence to me, in my opinion, it, it, it's like in the States, this, that whole thing with George Floyd wouldn't have been an issue until there was a financial consequence, the looting, the rioting, and then they paid attention. I'm not saying that that should happen here, but somewhere along the along the way if there's no financial consequence people won't care a lot of people a lot of people will not care about it yeah definitely and um yeah i, I we, we we will have to wrap this up because we're short on time unfortunately but this is always such a big discussion it's hard to leave <laughs> but i want to thank you all so much for being here Thank you for having us. Uh, Eric Barbour, Lydia Holt, and Seth Sharp. Thank you. Uh, and uh, hope to see you all again soon, again. Absolutely. And um, yeah, w w like I said, we will try to carry on this discussion in some form or another, either on this program or just on social media and in other media, because this discussion is very much needed. and. Um, I mean, I, I say this as a parent of 
children of color that have been growing up in Iceland. Uh, it's, a, it's a very needed discussion. And, um, and just for, you know, the coming generations also, because um, it's, it's very important. And, uh, but thank you so much for now. And uh, yeah, because Seth, you spoke of uh, Martin Luther King, um, the, the name of this program, Hin Reykjavik, the other Reykjavik, it's a reference to Martin Luther King also, where he spoke mm. about the other America, mm. which is, you know, the voices of the people who do not get heard in the mainstream. So this is the aim of our program to kind of bring those voices forward. So um, it's, it's very befitting that we're taking on this subject. And um, I'm, I'm, I just want to kind of close this with, um, uh, there was a very powerful image from the demonstration. There was a, a white woman holding a sign that said, sit with your discomfort. Mm. And this is absolutely something that we white people need to do. We need to take this discussion. It's, it's discomfort, but we have to have it. And uh, even me as a parent of people of color, you know, I, do, I say the wrong things. I do the wrong things. I, I can do things that are, you know, racist. But that doesn't mean I'm a racist. It means I'm a human being, like Lydia said, and I make mistakes. But I have to sit with that discomfort. And that's, it's okay to be wrong. And uh, I hope you can all forgive me if I'm wrong. <laughs> 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 and mostly if I can forgive myself. <laughs> yeah. Right. And uh, yeah, th this is just uncomfortable to say this even for me. Mm -hmm. so, um, and that is absolutely fine. Thank you all so much for being here. Like I said, it's a, it's a good, it's, it's a very needed topic. But goodbye to all of you, and um, and thank you all for watching. Thank, thank you. you. Bye thank bye. You.